and welcome to the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. This show explores people and their unique story of cooking. This will be a historical journey as well as a culinary experience. Each week we're going to look at a different group of people and how to create their story in your own kitchen. You don't have to be a four-star chef but you have to have a passion for cooking and a love for history and you can create these stories in your own home. On this episode we're going to be looking at Lower East Side immigrants and their story of cooking. Everyone knows now that I've grown up in Virginia, but I recently moved to New York City last year and my husband and I bought a apartment in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So this kind of inspired me to to want to, to learn more and uh, learn what these immigrants would have eaten when they came to America in the 1800s. In the 1800s when uh, Lower East Side immigrants came to New York City, they were often poor and they would settle in the tenement houses um, that were found all over the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, these houses were often overcrowded, um, hot. A typical kitchen in a tenement house building would have a coal or wood burning stove and that might be it. And the kitchen served as a place where they worked, a place where they ate, a place where they studied. There weren't many, many rooms in a tenement house. And what's, what's kind of interesting about tenement houses um, in the 1800s, you would have Jewish immigrants, Russian immigrants, Irish immigrants. In fact, on the Lower East Side, it was once known as Little Germany, and it actually had the third largest population of German people in the world, which is pretty interesting. The first thing we're gonna make um, in homage to the Jewish immigrants are matzo balls. Pretty easy to make. First, we're gonna start with four egg yolks. Bigger bowl to mix everything in. Okay, four egg yolks going in. Okay, the next thing that's gonna go in is one fourth a cup of chicken, rendered chicken fat. The uh, Jewish immigrants cooked with a lot of poultry fat um, as opposed to what you know I, I would use in my family, which would be lard, um, which is derived from pork. You do not eat pork in the Jewish culture especially back then. It was very popular to have goose farms in these tenement houses. Uh, for, for obvious reasons, you can eat them and you can use their fat to cook with. Um, the next thing that's gonna go in is our parsley, half a cup of parsley. Our kosher salt. Let's whisk that all together. Then we're going to add our matzo meal, stir that in. A matzo meal is just crushed matzo crackers. You can find these a lot of places, in the Lower East Side especially. You can't throw a rock without hitting a um, Jewish market or a Jewish deli from where I live in the Lower East Side. And they're, they're great. They're, their food is so good. My favorite place is actually this um, Jewish deli slash butcher shop down the street and you can get the best like rotisserie chickens there. I've never had a better rotisserie chicken and I've had rotisserie chicken in France so that's saying a lot. Okay the last thing that goes into these are the four egg whites from our um, egg yolks. We separated them. Always save your egg whites for another purpose. All right so we're gonna whip these until they get to a stiff peak and then we're gonna fold them in. So these look good. You want stiff peaks. We're going to fold this into our matzo ball mixture. So like I was saying, this, um, the Lower East Side still has a heavy Jewish population and there's still many, many, many um, Jewish run businesses. Probably the most popular one is Cat's Deli. It's been there since 1888. And if you go by there any day of the week, it's so crowded you really can't even get in with tourists and uh, that kind of thing. Um, it also was really made popular um, in the movie When Harry Met Sally. I don't know if any of you remember that scene from When Harry Met Sally, but 
she and Harry are eating in Cat's Deli and she has that kind of racy scene. I'll let, let you guys figure that out in, when Harry met Sally. So that kind of made Cat's Deli famous as well. Um, there's also the oldest Bialy Bakery in the United States there. That is just down the street from my house. So there's, there's a lot of really good Jewish places to visit. All right. You don't want to like mix it too much because you want it to still be fluffy. Okay. Just fold. A lot of wrist action. Okay. So we are going to take a spoon and we're going to drop it into our stock little matzo balls. You can make them as big as you want. In fact, Cat's Deli makes huge matzo balls because I am not a matzo ball expert. I'm going to make them about the size of golf balls. And you drop them into your simmering stock. And the, the goal is because of the egg whites, it should be fluffy and light. It kind of reminds me of when I was in culinary school, um, we did uh, mousseline, which is actually whipped meat. <laughs> but it's kind of the same kind of concept. You whip the egg whites and you drop them in um, simmering consomme, if you're doing the French way. Um, but you want them to be light and fluffy. They don't take long. Let's turn this heat up a little bit. Okay. One more. So again, um, immigrants t for to the Lower East Side would have wanted to take their own food traditions with them because it was a little taste of where they came from. Uh, one of the traditions that definitely was popular to this day and in the tenement houses was the idea of eating fish on Friday nights. Um, that's from the European tradition, still continue today. Also, you're probably all familiar with um, challah bread, the braided bread. That was also a tradition they brought with them from Europe. In Europe, it was actually um, kind of reserved for um, German gent gentiles, um, but in America, it became mainstream for poor immigrants to um, eat the challah bread. These are looking good. They're floating to the top. They're nice and light and fluffy. I'm going to finish making these matzo balls and get this area cleaned up, and when we come back, we're going to make German Wiener Schnitzel. Hi, and we're back. We're going to make our Wiener Schnitzel now. Uh, as I said earlier, German immigrants uh, came to the Lower East Side, and at one time, Lower East Side was called Little Germany. Now, unfortunately, they've all kind of moved out to other parts a lot. A lot of moved to Brooklyn and other areas of the city, um, but they still left their mark on the Lower East Side culinarily, and they definitely were the most populated immigrant group at one time. Um, again, third largest group of German people in the world. So that's that's pretty, that's a lot of people, a lot of German people. So the first thing we're gonna do is obviously for our Wiener Schnitzel, Wiener means veal. So we're gonna have um, four veal cutlets and we're gonna wanna pound them out until they're about a fourth of an inch thick. Uh, the best way to pound meat, I think, is just to wrap it in plastic wrap and pound it with a meat mallet. So we're gonna do that. Get out a little aggression too. My dad makes really, really good Wiener Schnitzel. He does it a little differently than I'm going to do it, but every time it was our birthday or, well, anytime it was our birthday really, or his birthday, he would always make Wiener Schnitzel. It was a big treat in my house. Okay, that looks pretty good. They were pretty thin to begin with. That is four veal cutlets. Unwrap them. And for those of you who have not had Wiener Schnitzel before, it's so good. It's just really thin veal and it's nice and crispy fried up in a pan. Very simple to do. So you take each veal cutlet and you dredge it in flour. You don't want a lot of flour because you're actually going to coat it again in breadcrumbs, but just enough to coat it. Shake off the extra. Set it aside. So my dad, uh, I mentioned that he made Wiener Schnitzel a lot. He 
he loves German food. He loves German beer even more, but he loves German food. Uh, he spent a lot of time in the in Germany when he was in the army, so he lived there for a few years. So he is a self-proclaimed German expert, certainly a German beer expert. <laughs> but Wiener Schnitzel is one of his specialties. He makes a few things really, really well. He he's a, he's a pretty good cook. I don't give him enough credit, but his two specialties are definitely Wiener Schnitzel and. Uh, an army breakfast called SOS, which I won't tell you what that means, but it's basically a gravy on toast. Very popular in the army. Okay, let's get rid of this. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do, the veal is ready to be coated with our egg mixture and our breadcrumbs, so we're gonna do that next. We're gonna take two eggs, Two eggs, uh, two tablespoons of Parmesan, uh, one a half a teaspoon of salt, excuse me, uh, two tablespoons of milk, uh, some parsley, I like parsley, and a pinch of nutmeg. Okay, and mix that all together. So the German immigrants in uh, the 1800s would come and they would live in the tenement houses, like I was referring to with the, the Jewish immigrants as well. Um, they, have, they also took, on, took their culinary traditions with them um, from Europe. One of the things I researched for this episode uh, were kraut novelers, which is actually a, it's a funny term, but basically that meant that they were German tradesmen that would go do, door to door in the Lower East Side, slicing cabbage for sauerkraut. And that was that was their trade. That's how they made their money. Um, in the tenement houses, sauerkraut and the German um, immigrants was obviously very, very popular. At one time, again, with the huge German population, the main street that had a lot of the tenement houses in the Lower East Side, called Orchard Street, had 10 German grocery stores. And it's not even that long of a street. so. That gives you another idea of how many um, German immigrants were in the area at the time. Other traditions they would have brought with them were pretzels, which we all love, and the idea of the beer garden started there too in America. So we can thank them for that. All right, so next we are going to melt six tablespoons of butter in our pan. This is what we're going to fry our wiener schnitzel in. You don't want it to burn. It's okay if it gets a little color, though. Okay. Take our veal cutlet. Dredge it in the egg mixture. Take it to the breadcrumbs. And you can use any breadcrumbs you want, really. I like unseasoned breadcrumbs. My dad a little embarrassed to say what he uses, but I'm going to say it anyway. He uses mashed up cornflakes. Because it's the American version of the German Wiener Schnitzel, but it's really good. Alright, let's give that a second. Here. So you want this really hot sizzling in the pan, so when this hits it, it cooks fast and it gets crispy. Do the others. Same process. And it won't take long. You do need to flip them as soon as they're crispy on one side. All right, I think we can fit one more in there. I'm always getting messy. All right. Last one. Okay. We'll do that one in a minute. My pan was a little more crowded than I thought it was going to be. So the veal is pounded out so thinly, it literally doesn't take much longer than a minute per side, or 30 seconds per side, depending on how hot your pan is. But it's important that you get that golden crispy crust. If you've got the golden crispy crust, the veal's cooked. 
Just like that. Looks good. Okay, these are looking good. Give them a flip. Another 30 seconds more on the other side. I'm gonna finish this last one uh, and get this area cleaned up. And when we come back, we will make our Chinese dumplings. Okay, now we're back and we have everything set up to make our Chinese dumplings. The Chinese um, certainly have made their impact on the Lower East Side. They weren't um, the first people to immigrate to the Lower East Side. They actually came later than the other immigrants I've been talking about today. But they certainly have made a huge impact on the Lower East Side, especially in the form of cuisine. Um, the Lower East Side is actually bordered to the south and to the west by Chinatown. So the first thing we're going to do is put our shrimp in the food processor. We want to grind that up. Lost a few. Looks good. I'm gonna grind it up because this is gonna be the one of the main components of our pot sticker filling. Or Chinese dumpling filling, excuse me. Okay. Let's just set this aside for a second. We're gonna do the same thing to our ground beef. We have one pound of shrimp, one pound of ground beef. Pretty ground, but just for uniformity's sake, let's pulse it a little. Ah, struggling today. Okay. All right, that looks good. Get this off, and we're gonna put both of our meats into a bigger bowl. Okay, meat into a bowl, ground beef, and our shrimp. So in the Lower East Side, the first Chinese immigrants would have actually appeared probably around 1860. Uh, the Chinese immigrants had already settled in America. Out West, they were um, mostly railroad workers. And so they, they came um, from, from out West, railroad workers, to the Lower East Side around the 1860s. But they really started populating the area much later. Okay, so I just added some Napa cabbage, about two leaves of Napa cabbage that's chopped up. That's, to that I'm gonna add um, some scallions, about a bunch of, uh, one bunch of scallions, also chopped. A red onion, you can use a shallot as well. Fourth a cup. We have some soy sauce. Some ground ginger. Definitely staples in Asian cooking. Sesame oil. Sesame oil is very strong. You don't have to use a lot. It packs a lot of punch. A pinch of sugar and some kosher salt. Smells good. I love the smell of ginger. All right, so you're just gonna mix all of that together. This is your filling. Looks good. We got the shrimp, we got the beef. We got those Asian flavors working in there. Cabbage is also a very common Asian ingredient. So in New York City, my favorite place to go for dumplings is right down the street. Um, it's called Prosperity Dumpling. They have the best dumplings in New York City, hands down. So good. Okay. All right, that looks good. Next step, you're gonna take your dumpling wrapper. we have over here. Let me wipe my hands down real fast. Your dumpling wrapper. Have a little cup of water. See you in a second. And that's it. So to make our dumplings, we are going to take one wrapper at a time. Take a spoon. Try to get a spoonful that has everything in there. And just put a little in the dumpling and wet the edges with your finger so it sticks to itself. Fold over. Just like that. 
Not as good as prosperity dumplings, but it'll taste good. So I'll do a few for you. You can put anything in a dumpling as well. Um, there are a lot of dumpling houses in New York City and they put all sorts of things in there. I like one with a lot of meat. Just my personal favorite. They have vegetarian ones, ones with fish. They even have tofu ones. They're also, steam buns are really popular. Okay. Do a few more. Okay, I'm gonna do one more. And get those in the pan. Oop, sorry. One more, seal that one up. I'm gonna put oil in a hot, medium, medium high heat pan. You're gonna brown them on one side. Put a little oil in the pan. Okay, that heat for a second. You know oil's hot when it starts to ripple. Okay, place the dumplings down in the pan. And let that go for like a minute, maybe two. Um, and then we're going to steam them, cover them, and cook them the rest of the way that way. So we got our dumplings in our pan browning on one side. So the Lower East Side today is different than it was back um, when the immigrants first came. It's actually taken on a very um, modern gentrification, if you will, in the mid-2000s. It's full of upscale boutiques and fine dining. But the thing I really like about the Lower East Side and why I chose to live there um, was, sorry, it's loud, was that it still maintains its, its heritage and its culture and where it came from, um, which I find very, very cool. And it's still got that gritty city vibe, too. So all I did was add water. We're going to cover it and let that steam for about five to seven minutes until they're, they're cooking the filling through. And then we're gonna take the cover off when the water's almost steamed out, and we're gonna flip them, brown them on the other side, and they'll be ready to serve. So while that's happening, I'm gonna get this area cleaned up, and when we come back, we'll have all of our three dishes plated. Okay, and we're back, and we have all three dishes plated. Your Lower East Side immigrant-inspired meal we have the matzo balls and the nice broth, chicken stock broth. They're nice and fluffy. They've got the herbs in there, looking good. And these are our Chinese dumplings. We finished steaming them again for about five to seven minutes. We gave them a quick flip and let them brown for another minute or two on the other side. You can serve these just as they are or they're great with an Asian dipping sauce. And lastly, hopefully I did my dad proud, we have the Wiener Schnitzel. And it's really good served with the juices that's left in the pan after you're frying. Pour them over. And then always good with a slice of lemon. Squeeze that on top as well. Some people like to eat it with mustard. Your choice entirely. It's even great just as it is. Thank you for joining me on this chapter of the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. I'll see you next time.